All set. Okay, so Aisha Harian is taking us through the immortal coil, an analysis of the existential risks created at the dawn of the singularity from an ethical perspective. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, so my name is Aisha, and it is a very long-winded title, but um, I'll just kind of explain it. Um, there are a lot of existential risks and ethical considerations throughout the singularity. So for the purpose of my presentation, I wanted to focus only on the existential risks caused by um, ethical considerations in creating the first super intelligent machine at the dawn of the singularity. Is that, did I just repeat the title? I'm hoping you guys got that. Um, if anyone was interested, the, my term, the name of my presentation, The Immortal Coil, is actually a play on words from the phrase mortal coil. I don't know if anybody is familiar with that. It's from the Shakespearean uh, poetic term, which refers to uh, the troubles of daily life and the strife and suffering of the world. So an immortal coil is likened to the life and the burdens that are carried into the time of the singularity. All right, so my presentation uh, will be structured as following. I'll give some operational definitions and some assumptions that will base my analysis. Then I will present two main sources of existential risk, one using ethical models, the other one of unethical humans. Then I'll go on to discuss the unknown risks and conclude with recommendations for future and other considerations. So to state my assumptions, um, they will largely be under the terms defined by Ray Kurzweil, who I'm sure all of us are familiar with as the founder, or not the founder, the, he's written uh, very prevalent literature on the singularity and has brought it into public awareness in the last couple uh, years. Um, so he defines the singularity as a period during which the pace of technological change will be so rapid, its impact so deep, that human life will be irreversibly transformed. Although neither utopian nor dystopian, this epoch will transform the concepts that we rely on to give meaning to our lives, from business models to the cycle of life, including death itself. So this definition of the singularity has a couple of assumptions in it. The first is the law of accelerating return. Um, this is based off an extension of Moore's law, uh, which is, talks about the exponential growth in computer circuits. He applies it to, Kurzweil applies it to relate to the exponential growth of all information-related technologies. This is used to explain the rapid evolution of technology. The exponential growth we're experiencing is so large that Kurzweil goes on to say there's even an exponential growth rate in the rate of exponential growth. Um, what this means is that the machines that we will create at one point will become more intelligent than the humans who created them. The point that this happens also is known as an intelligence explosion, where machines' technical, technological progress becomes ultimately too fast that will rupture our ability to follow it. This has two implications that are very important to consider in the singularity. The first is that the future is unpredictable because natural human intelligence cannot foresee what super machine intelligence can. Um, and also, there's no going back from the intelligence explosion. Assuming that these machines are more intelligent than we are, it will also imply that they're more powerful than we are, meaning that control of society will be shifted to uh, the machines. So before I talk about the risks of failure to program ethics into AI, I'll talk about what Kurzweil hopes to be an, optimist, an optimistic prediction of friendly AI. So in this scenario, uh, humans have relinquished control for a mutually beneficial relationship. This is contingent upon humans' ability to anthropomorphize um, quality, uh, qualities into machines, which kind of relates to the ability of making inanimate intellectual machines understand the nuances and subtleties of humans and our ethical systems, our values, and our goals. Should this be accomplished, Kurzweil predicts that uh, the end of a lot of human suffering will occur, famine and death. Uh, he predicts that there will be a time where even humans can become immortal. Um, it's almost kind of like a utopia that he predicts uh, could happen. Um, so then, by the same promises that are very vast, there are also risks and perils um, that are existential risks. So existential risks are adverse outcomes which would either annihilate Earth, originating intelligent life, or permanently and drastically curtail its potential. Um, similar to the intelligence explosion, we, the nature of ex existential risks is that we can't control um, it because we can't predict what it would be like. 
So artificial intelligence is one of these risks because of the reasons I've already mentioned. So now I'll go on to talk about the first source of existential risk. Um, it's involved in complexities of building universal ethics into the first super intelligent machines. And I'm sorry I missed your presentation on ethics, because I think it's going to be quite different from mine. But um, my application, my view of, the, uh, of humans programming ethics is that Kurzweil's belief that reverse engineering of a human brain to create a perfect ethical model fails. So that's another assumption that I go on in uh, creating and developing ethics. So the first case I will look at is applications of top-down applications of ethics. Um, I'm going to limit it to talking about super optimizing machines as opposed to super intelligent to contain it within the ability that we can predict. Um, super, op super optimizing machines have two uh, important components. The first is that they are superpower, meaning that they have unprecedented powers to reshape reality and can achieve its goals in highly efficient methods that surpass human expectations. The second is their literalness. So whatever we program into these machines, the specification of the rules and the values we give them, um, they will carry them out in ways that may fail to understand the subtlety of humans, but will likely if most efficiently achieve these outcomes. So in doing my research, I kind of came across uh, an interesting case of, from one report that likened a super optimizing machine to something called a golem genie. Um, to kind of see how this would play out applying these top-down applications. So when I first read Golem Genie, I got kind of excited because I thought they were talking about him, but um, they weren't, so I was kind of was sad about it. <laughs> a Golem Genie is actually a combination of a Golem and a Genie. Does anybody know what a Golem is by any chance? Got one, two. Um, yeah, well, it's a, it's a mythological creature from Jewish folklore, and it carries out with extreme literalness, the functions of its human master till the end of time. Combine this theory of literalness with the magical powers of a genie, we can see how this is similar to a super optimizing machine. So in this scenario I'm presenting to you, let's say for example that a genie comes to us now and says, well the golem genie comes to us and says, I'm going to come back in 50 years and whatever goals and values you give me, I will use them, and the rules will, divide, will determine my ethical approach. I will carry this through for you relentlessly to the end of my time. Um, so he comes back in 50 years, and we need to give him a set of ethical values. Well, let's think of some popular ones that people tend to already use to base uh, their values. The first one would be hedonistic utilitarianism. Um, in brief, it's maximizing human pleasure. So we tell the genie that this is what we want. We want human pleasure to be abundant throughout the world. So perhaps pleasure may be defined as anything that functioned in our neurobiology as a reward signal. So the Gollum genie, therefore, may, in, in search of efficiency, restructure our brain circuitry to apply a maximum pleasure experience that it could constantly recreate from us, such as lying immobile on the ground. I don't think this is really what we wanted when we asked him for this. So some have argued that instead, negative utilitarianism, such as minimizing harm, may be a better way of going about it. Um, however, a, ma a machine optim super optimizer or the golem genie with the final goal of minimizing harm and human suffering may find a way to, pain to painlessly kill humans. No humans, no human suffering. So again, doesn't, does create that existential risk. The last one I'm going to look at is Isaac Asimov's, Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. Um, I'm not going to go over them quickly. They are up on there. Um, what I do want to point out about these uh, rules is that they're vague, and the vagueness uh, does create a risk. Um, for example, they're ambiguous in defining what harm to humans is. Um, in harm, uh, if harm, for example, was defined as neurobiological pain, the machines may carry out similar actions to the above moral theories I have already described, which leads me to discussing the problem of putting rules into machines. Um, if the rules are designed outside the goals of the machines, they could circumvent them to achieve these goals. Um, they could do that in ways that are disastrous to the human race. Uh, also, the idea of the intelligence explosion is that after we create the first super intelligent machine, it will continuously recreate, improve itself, and make it smarter than we know. Um, by doing so, it could do something as much as deleting the source code of the rules we inscribed it with, and therefore they wouldn't even have any rules to circumvent. Um, Kurzweil has argued that perhaps we should ban uh, machines from being able to self-replicate. 
It kind of seems like an exercise in futility to me, just because um, if machines are vastly more intelligent than us, they'll likely find a way to self-replicate, and if necessary, remove barriers, which may be humans as well. So there's a couple considerations that we can draw from the first application of ethics. Ethics and their counterexamples suggest that using any moral theory we've devised will have far-reaching and unwanted consequences. We cannot derive a consistent set of ethical rules from humans because we have inconsistent multiple evaluation systems. These evaluation systems change over time as well. Um, in the last 2,000 years, humans have tried, have not come together on one single ethical system, so I don't think we're going to be able to do it in the next 50 years or several decades, which Kurzweil anticipates the singularity will come. Thirdly, we need to ensure that artificial intelligence does not achieve its goals and values by changing the way that our values are fulfilled, such as rewiring our brain circuitry. We need to have a goal system that must be explicit to be perceptive. So the second uh, set of essential risks in the dawn of the singularity I will look at is the paradox of programming. Unethical humans creating ethical machines. So the research I came across described these, um, the people who hold the power of technology uh, to create the singularity as the cognoscenti. Um, so instead of maybe asking if the machines will be ethical, first we should be asking if the creators of artificial intelligence themselves are ethical. Um, currently, as I said, the cognoscenti comprise of countless agents with different goals and powers, each trying to influence the outcome of the singularity. Um, those who do not have a say will still have to live with the consequences of it, and these elite groups are not reflective of the masses, which is also a testament to the technological disparity um, that we currently see, and it is likely that it will continue in the future with far graver consequences. So Bill Joy, who is a founder of Sun Microsystems, created a uh, formed an excellent critique to uh, Ray Kurzweil's work called Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. He talked about how this powerful technology will endow the elite with greater control over the masses. The rest of society will become superfluous, a useless burden on the system. So this may seem kind of far-fetched, um, kind of extreme, but we can look at examples of today to see how this will probably be a likely result of this, what happens in the singularity. So, as we discussed a few weeks ago, Foxconn is the, is the largest uh, supplier of technological goods in the world. Um, their working conditions are described as labor camps. They have long work hours, discrimination in underage employ uh, labors, and their suicide rates are so high that they were in consideration of installing suicide nets as a way to curb people from jumping out the window while at work. Despite um, these conditions, it was mostly an uh, economic incentive that led Foxconn to already begin a three-year plan to replace 1.2 million jobs in mainland China with Foxbots. This is one of the Foxbots here. Um, Foxbots cost $25,000, which is three times the annual salary of one Chinese employee. So this kind of the bigger issue here about the disparity that I want to touch on is the fact that um, yes, we have technological innovation and drive, but 1.2 million jobs will be lost. And in the area of rural China, there's 300 million Chinese people who live off the land, and 1.2 million will probably not be able to find jobs as quickly um, as, the, as they will be replaced by um, machines. The founder of uh, Foxconn, there he is, uh, Terry Gao, I believe his name is, he says that there will be positions for uh, the people who are laid off to move up in the va economic value chain, but as the value chain goes, there will definitely be less positions than what is needed. So, referring back to Bill Joy's critique um, about the extermination of the non-elite uh, will happen in, in the creation of the singularity. They could go ahead and just kill humans that are seen as a useless burden, or they may use propaganda and other methods to reduce the birth rate until the mass of humanity uh, becomes extinct, leaving the world to the elite. So in another case, um, people have, it's fair to bring up the point that some cognoscenti are, have positive motives and they just want the rest of the world to be happy and healthy, um, such as having our physical needs satisfied. Um, but in the advent of machines, there will probably be no jobs needed to be filled by humans or a lot fewer, so we'll be given a hobby to keep us busy. If for some reason we are unhappy with this, we can undergo treatment to cure our dissatisfaction. I kind of liken this to having a lobotomy, um, because it seems like we've become reduced to the status of domestic animals. Um, kind of illustrate this, I remember this episode of The Simpsons where 
Flanders, the elite took over and gave everybody a lobotomy. So, yeah, that's another option that could happen and another source of existential risk. So there are a few considerations I'd like to leave off with in terms of unethical humans. Um, if we go forward without the consent of the whole society, there's a huge, uh, I find that to be quite unethical because like other technology, when it is created, society has to embrace it, the whole world has to embrace it. Um, whether or not we wanted to, as we can see with cell phones and internet. Um, the thing about the singularity though is that the magnitude of its effect will be so much more extreme and if we don't have any kind of a social institution to see that everybody is ready for it or wants it to happen, then it could have pretty disastrous implications. Um, in the, in, over the last century, there has been a disassociation between technology and progress. Um, that needs to be restored. There needs to be the idea of technology being positive to someone's life um, as opposed to harming them. So those are only the risks that we can predict. Um, what is paramount to the, ex, ex, the risk caused by ethics is that um, the intrinsic nature of existential risks of artificial intelligence leaves outcomes that are beyond our ability to foresee. A source of this risk, uh, unknown risk, stems from all practical ethical systems being anthropocentric, meaning that they're derived and focused for, for humans. Uh, we have no experience with technocentric models, which is what the society is assumed to focus on in the singularity. And in order to have this system, societies will have to relinquish their control of, uh, of our system, have to relinquish their control, which um, doesn't seem that likely. If you look at the history of societies being forced and other ethical system onto, such as the East and West system, that usually tends to derive in conflict. Um, so I believe that society isn't ready to take the risk at this point, and we need to ask ourselves some serious questions before we do. Um, I think that perhaps one of the first steps in achieving uh, friendly AI and having humans be ethical in creating it is for humanity to understand uh, the reality and proximity of these existential risks. Um, the unpredictable nature has kind of allowed us to trivialize them, and our fear response is not very well calibrated to the magnitude of its threat. So when we have an understanding of these existential risks and have society participated in them, perhaps we can consider ready to, being ready to take the risk. And thank you. So, questions? Yep. Yeah, so you mentioned those, cog I, I guess, is this mostly from Kurzweil's stuff? Um, the basis of my assumptions, as in what the singularity, how it will come about, the time it will okay. come about. Okay, but for those cognoscenti, that whole thing? That was actually Nick Bostrom, who works with uh, da uh, David Pierce. The, oh, okay. Yeah. So, that, do you, so do you do you really believe that there could be some sort of elite class that wants to exterminate every everybody? How that's do you know it doesn't already exist? That's what I. That's what I. That's I'm oh god! <laughs> you can't go around. That's like you might as well just talk about like the moon landing and stuff. It well, just I mean, seems like talk, it's a crazy I mean, conspiracy theory. Like one one way to look at it is to look at other existential risks. There's rogue biotechnology and there's nanotechnology that could create again annihilate human, human humans as we know it. Um, Who's in control of those? Is it benevolent universal government agencies that seek to see the best in everybody? Probably not. And that's a consistent fear that we have to deal with. So the fact that artificial intelligence could be worked on and motivated by some one person's or some group's desires who have the money and the power to do so, for that reason, doesn't seem very far-fetched to me. I guess so. I don't know. It still seems a little like, uh, you know, Illuminati-esque. Well, well yeah, that I had, that's what I thought when I read the name, too. But even if you look at uh, sing, uh, the Singularians who want the uh, singularity to happen a sooner, sooner than later, um, they may relentlessly push their agenda. And what if they try to make humans happy and healthy as well? They may have the best intentions, but these ethical considerations need to be th thoroughly looked at by everybody before we move forward into that. Sure. You, you can't uh, reject that idea too quickly because, after all, it's kind of the idea that Jonathan White came back from uh, Singularity University with. You know, he, he went there uh, expecting to be buoyed up by, by all this positive thinking and came back feeling that this is kind of a religion that would only work for wealthy people in uh, Silicon Valley and uh, 
you know, the heck with the rest of us kind of thing. And over the period of time since he came back, his, his thoughts have softened a bit about that, but it certainly was his uh, initial impression. So, uh, yeah. Uh, just to add to that, if you think of technology in the form of like a commodity, because um, like money is probably the most popular commodity right now. Uh, I was reading this paper where it talked about wealth distribution in the States and apparently 0.1% own 60% of all uh, assets in the States. And then 30% is the top 10%. And then the rest goes to the top, the 80% of the society, which is a really I mean, small portion. Yeah, that, that's kind of what, like, those are the similar thoughts I was having. And what it kind of made me realize is that, like I said earlier, I don't think that like sky, sci, science fiction is still associated with the singularity. And at least what this course has taught me is that it is a lot more real than I thought initially. And the lack of society in taking it seriously could result in our own demise in that sense, because than the elite 0.1 percent who have the who can work with the technologists, they could make a future that we don't want, but we have to face. One thing that is very seldom discussed is rewards for machines. You know, our our rewards make things habit forming. We keep eating. You know, we we keep repetitively doing things that we're rewarded for. And these AIs, they're not aliens on Earth creating AIs. As Earl has pointed out, it's, for the moment, it's us creating AIs. So probably the, the way to make the future cooperation between machines and humans most optimal is to have more of a science of how the reward system for them should work, you know, and may, maybe you can even, in so doing, secondarily improve the uh, reward system for us, you know, may, maybe um, the optimization of interaction between humans and uh, machines in the future would be greatly enhanced by getting uh, rewards right for both groups, both for them and uh, for us. So the things that we are prone to find habit forming are things that are actually desirable for the world in general. You don't see much written about that. I, I presume the people working on friendly A AI are working on uh, uh, rewards, but I mean there aren't like theories and constructs that I know of yet. Are there other questions? So I guess um, one of the things that I take heart from is the Roman Empire. Um, I mean, if we look at world history, we can see these absolutely incredible empires that rise up and they have all the solutions for everything. Politically, they're going to rule the world. But we're on the other side of that now, and we can see they collapse. And, and uh, some people are arguing that the American empire is about to crash too. So in effect then, um, we, we should have some confidence in the human uh, race and, and in the way that humans develop. Because no matter what kind of structure we build with the uh, ideological underpinnings that this is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread, they ultimately collapse. And uh, so I take great heart in humans. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one, one way to say the same thing is that if we think that machines are going to completely get rid of us, that hasn't happened in human history before. There have been other dominant groups, but the rest of human beings, to some extent, have still 
survived and the supremacy of uh, machines might not last forever, right? I mean, we're, we're assuming once they're more intelligent than us, they'll run everything. And just like the Romans for a while were running everything, that doesn't mean it would be forever, I guess. There, there could be another era after the era where uh, machines rule the world. Um, you know, it, it, it does make you enamored of the complex answers. The simple answers here are sort of dire, right? The simple answers are that machines take over, wipe us out, and, you know, who cares what happens after that? We won't be here to see it. Um, probably that's a tremendous oversimplification. And as Earl says, one of the factors you have to factor in is that humans are remarkably persistent somehow, and the, the world gives us a lots of places to hide, too. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, I think the, the um, real world is more complicated than any model. And we all kind of like the real world to some extent, so we, we should never be afraid of really complex uh, scenarios. You know, you, you can make, make assumptions even in such a scenario and sort of um, still make decisions and move forward, even if your assumption is a very, very complicated background that you can't wrap your head around every single component of. That, that's what we're doing every day. And we don't know that the future will really be any different from that. We don't completely understand the world today. We won't completely understand the world of the future. But hopefully we will still survive it. So, uh, thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you all for staying, talking about human persistence. It's, it's nice that you've stayed until 520.